The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We can think and imagine and feel and, and do all of these amazing things. Bless us. Fill us through your gracious means by your spirit. Make us alive in Christ and cause the things that we say and do to give you honor and glory and share Christ with others. We pray in his holy name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. <coughs> um, we're going to continue today in the section on uh, the priesthood and ministry. That chapter in your textbook um, is chapter 21. We're on page 417. The book is called to believe, teach, and confess. Uh, this is from Whip and Stock Publishers. That's W-I-P-F, Whip and Stock Publishers, edited by Stephen Mueller. And uh, it's, an, a, it's a wonderful uh, beginner's level uh, doctrinal book uh, that I think really brings a lot of clarity uh, to some things. And uh, of course, we're supplementing it as we go to uh, go a little deeper. Uh, this isn't a format where we can discuss anything in its complete entirety. It's not designed for that. Um, we would do a whole class on something like election if we were going to go into that in any kind of depth, or a whole class on the ministry. So we're just kind of summary covering topics to kind of get our feet wet. We are on the section about uh, that deals with the roles of men and women in the church on page 417. To kind of recap from last week, we began talking about creation. We dug into Genesis, and we saw, for example, that God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. Um, and he did this ex nihilo. Um, I'm calling up Genesis 1. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> if you want to look in your Bible or on your phone or tablet Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are active in creation from the moment of its beginning. God, or Elohim in Hebrew, uh, being sort of a generic term or title for God, we understand to be the Father. And the Spirit, hovering over the face of the waters, is self-explanatory. And then God's speaking, His Word, that's the Son in verse 3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And John, of course, picks up on this in opening his gospel within the beginning uh, was the Word, and so forth. Um, in down in verses uh, 27 and 28, I want to say, um, there we go. Well, we pick up that Trinitarian language, actually, in 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them so we know it's plural mankind have dominion over the fish of the sea or stewardship I prefer even though that word stewardship has a little baggage and makes people feel a little queasy because it's usually associated with give money right um, stewardship is a bigger word I, I like that word, stewardship, because it has really this caretaker sense. Like, we should be taking care of the earth. If we are good stewards of the earth, we don't litter it up and junk it up. We take good care of it, right? So it's, it's caretaker. So to have dominion, take care of the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and every living thing that moves uh, on the earth, etc. So, kind of as a recap, God created Aha! Uh -huh. I used past tense and I want to use present tense. Makes Male and female, we're going to pick that up. All right. 
So God created man in his, this is verse 27, so God created man in his own image, Genesis 1. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay. So we have already in scripture the use of that noun, man, uh, to kind of cover mankind. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, etc. All right? So God makes people male and female. We talked about XY is, and even science bears witness to this natural law, XY is male, XX is female. Yeah, and because of creation being cursed and broken, uh, there can be in um, a minority of cases, and probably a rather small percentage of cases, issues, chromosomal issues and so forth, without getting into all of that, we just kind of remember, well, um, the exception is not the rule. See? So we go with the rule and we deal with the exception on an exceptional basis. Okay? So God made them uh, male and female and still does today. Then in Genesis 2, we get into the actual creation of men and women, and in recapping, now we're going to go a little deeper today. Okay. Verse 7, Genesis 2. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. Okay. So he forms the male from the dust of the earth, and breathed into him the breath of life. And he became a living creature. And then he gives him a job. This is hugely significant. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man he had formed. Okay. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then it talks about the rivers. Verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it or caretake. Let's talk about that. So God made man made male from dust. Okay. I could say God made man, but I don't want to confuse the issue with mankind and so forth, because he didn't make Eve from the dust. So God made the male, maybe I should say the, sorry about that, that might appear really small on camera, apologies to our beloved family members watching the video. God made the male from dust. And then did something. He said, go get the high score on Mario Smash Brothers. No, he didn't. He said, but I'm still trying. Uh, he said, work. And steward. Okay. In other words, ready for this? Provide and protect. Work the land and care for it provide and protect. But there's more. But wait, there's more. Act now, and you get Eve. No. Um, <coughs> you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God gives man a job to do. You are to provide, you are to protect, and he says, now, 
in the context of my creating you and giving you a job to do, giving you a purpose, right? Stay with me, kid, and you'll be all right. Leave me and your toast, <laughs> right? God is the author of life. If you separate from life, you get the opposite, which is death. Yes. We mentioned this last week also, but you know, both of those words, um, we, we typically think of both providence and protection as coming from God, and Adam yeah. is set to do that in God's stead, to basically do what God does. That's right, exactly. This is a mirror image, created in our own image. Now the image, the, 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 the literal meaning of the image is original righteousness. Okay. But in addition, we can think, create, feel, act, mirror what God, so what does God do as a father? Provides and protects. Provides creation, protects it, sets the man there as his steward, right, to care for, yeah, you got it, yes. You said in our image, an image as it's correctly interpreted is righteousness. Uh-huh, uh -huh. I always wondered about that word there. Oh, so, image, the word image. Yeah, so make yeah. man in our righteousness. Yes, that's yes, okay. yes. And that, that's so, thank you, because that helps us understand the whole tree thing. Because God's not a person. Right. You know, so, right. where did person come from? Yeah, two arms, two legs. Yeah, exactly, that's not God. Exactly. Yeah, 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 so, right, right? Yeah. And so God is saying to keep and retain that image right. of righteousness, be righteous. Okay. Don't, he gives him, he's got one rule, <laughs> don't, don't eat of the tree. And well, you know how this goes. <laughs> I think it's interesting too how it says don't eat of it. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 can you read that again? For in the day. For in the day. Uh-huh, that you eat of it, you shall. Is it a foregone conclusion that he's going to? Uh -huh. For in the day you do. Yeah, no, it's yeah. not. It's not. It's not foregone. That it's not foregone in the sense of predetermined. Right. Um, it God's foreknowledge knows what will happen, yeah. but doesn't cause it. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. In the day, and that's an idiomatic expression. Everything's going to change the moment, actually, not just day, yeah. but the moment you break from righteousness, you're done because you've. You've left yeah, me and I'm right, life. Right. Yeah, yeah. So to retain that image in which he's made, don't eat from the tree, don't break my rule, okay? And look what happens very next verse 18. This is so interesting. And if it's not just not, and I won't feel bad, right? Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone, I will make him a helper fit for him. So, and we talk, began to talk about this last week. He is there to provide and protect, but he has nobody to do this for. That's bad English. He has nobody for whom to do these things. And that's why. Every day of creation, God's like, yeah, that's good. Oh, look at that. That's good. Yeah, look at that. That's good. Now something is not good. And the first something to not be good is the man is created with these purposes that he cannot fulfill apart from the woman. Okay? And God instructs Adam visually rather than just saying, hey, Adam, you know, I gave you these jobs that, by the way, you can't do them until. He's going to let Adam learn and grow into this understanding that he needs the woman. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed, verse 19, every beast of the field, bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. As part of the dominion thing, he gets kind of like a little piece of God's authority. God made all this stuff, and God's like, here, I'll delegate to you. You can name them whatever you want. That's pretty slick. That's awesome, right? See what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gives names in verse 20 to everything. And then the second sentence in verse 20. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. 
God didn't need that discovery. God knew that. Adam is the one not finding a helper fit for him. So, verse 21, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, for surgery, and while he slept, took one of his ribs, and took really the side stuff, more than just the bone rib, but side stuff, right? And uh, closed up its place with flesh, verse 22, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now, in Hebrew, the word for man is ish. The word for woman is isha, for she was taken from a man. Even the language, or man, woman. You know, the language that we use is very biblical and is really predicated on understanding creation and where all of us came from and what uh, what we are about. Then the man said, verse 23, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Quite literally, <laughs> right? She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. All right? Therefore a man shall leave, verse 24, his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So God takes a chunk out of Adam, and he's literally missing. So in the same way that he brought the animals so that Adam learns, yeah, something's missing, he takes his side, now something's really, really missing, and it's also closest to his heart, and he makes the woman to be the completion of him, the one flesh is rejoined in that arrangement, man and woman. See? And he calls her woman. She's taken out of man. Literally. And every one of us knows we are not complete without the woman. That's our hunt. That's our drive and our search. We are not, you know, unless God gives, which he does, unless God gives us that vocation, which he does sometimes. We're not done yet, right? So God made the male from the dust, but he made the female from the male. So God made the female female male. Every word we have for this stuff indicates an order. God made the female from the male. The term helper is etzer in Hebrew. It's a word that God uses about himself in the Psalms. He's the helper of man. This should tell us immediately, and of course you have to know that, you know, so grace, right? This tells us immediately that to be the helper is in no way demeaning. And that actually it is a God-given vocation for women to be the completion, for woman to be the completion of man. The one thing not good about creation is solved by the existence of women. Oh, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> you know, that's a big deal, right? That is an upgrade. <laughs> that's a big deal, right? Um, to be the Aitzer, um, to be. Apart from the existence of the woman, man will never fulfill his purpose. He can't. Just can't. So that is why the man, realizing his incompleteness, <coughs> leaves his father and his <coughs> mother, moves out of the basement, hopefully before 40, <laughs> but I'm not bitter, and, <laughs> and goes in search of right? We know how this works, is supposed to work, used to work. The guy asks out the girl. Used to be typically. For this reason, he's got a gaping hole in the side of him close to his heart that only his rib 
can fill. So Reverend Dr. Martin Luther called Katie, his wife, his rib. So I call Cheryl my rib. Because as much as I'm still not right, I really wasn't right until I had my rib. <laughs> okay? So, so God made the female from the male. He can't do his God-given purposes without her. So it was not good until she was made. Now it's good. See? Jesus quotes this in the New Testament. Does it not say that God made them, you know, male and female? Man shall leave his father and mother be joined to his wife. Therefore, what God has joined, let no man put asunder. So that putting asunder is the equivalent, and everybody who's gone through this knows it, is the equivalent of having somebody tear up your heart and stomp on it. Because it is that. It's like somebody ripping your sides apart. Yeah. So God made the man. This is the created order. So marriage is this. And only this. Before God is one man, one woman, one flesh. That's it. And it's not any other. In fact, gender only exists for procreation. Otherwise, there's no point. Right? Um, <clears throat> so... And that's the, that's the other... Now, God makes the male and female. Be fruitful and multiply, procreate, which he can't do without her. Right. So, and again, just not trying to risk being crass, but talking in biblical terms, in the same way that these are puzzle pieces, his missing rib has to come back to him that he may be whole. Procreation puts the puzzle pieces together that they may be whole in keeping the command, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, which you can't do without male and female. That's why they exist. Right? And so God says in Malachi, God brought them together and put a portion of his spirit upon them and what was the Lord God seeking but godly children. Not just procreation, but godly children. Yes. It, it, occurs to me, it occurs to me just now, kind of in the language of yeah. um, fulfillment, that from, from the standpoint of, of God and the, you know, the Almighty, fulfillment um, sort of produces a creative <coughs> process. God is God is one. God is whole. Creates yeah. Yeah. Um, man and woman separately. Do not create, but in fulfillment create. Uh, Christ and His Church. Uh, when when the church is fulfilled by Christ, the Holy Spirit produces. There there's something kind of uh -huh. r repetitive, or or you know, it, it it shows over and over that fulfillment then is a creative process. It is. That's really good. It it is. In fact. And what the man and the woman are allowed to do is called procreate to indicate God's allowing them to be a part of that creative process. Um, he does the creating. Mm -hmm. And what do you know? Through means. <laughs> God works through means. He works through the one flesh union of husband and wife mm -hmm. to procreate, to continue making people. Yeah, and putting a portion of his spirit upon them. Uh, that's Malachi 2. So, how precious. Costly precious. How amazing is this. That, that God should not only make us limited as we are, but grant to us some of his very own authority, authority and creative ability. That, that he should say to us, but well, clearly, if God, God, the God who can speak a universe into existence can speak a population. Right. But he didn't. He, in, in love, he said, hey, creation, people, I'm going to let you do this. You're going to share with me in my divine creative process. 
here you go. And here's, here's how it works. Here's how the, 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 the machinery of creation continues and how you fill the earth and, uh, and caretake for it. You know, this is... So, and, and so wouldn't it figure that the devil would want to wreck this? Wouldn't it figure that if you're going to attack God, you attack through the family and through family relationships? You know, wouldn't it figure, if you're going to, and this is what the devil does, do the opposite of God's will, you re-attack his creative order. So you go after what is male and what is female. Oh, I'll be my own God and decide. In the twisted cursedness of sin, right? I'll, I'll, I'll identify, which which does nothing to change the reality of X, Y, and XX, right? Or the fact that God makes people him. Go after marriage. Have a sexual revolution, which ends in what? Uh, massive amounts of divorce, legalization of abortion, da 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 People da -da. being really confused about who they are now. People what's being their, confused. What's their purpose? And what's what, their purpose? You know? Absolutely. Both genders. Right. If you, yeah, if, right, if you're evil and wicked and want to undo God created, come at it from the bottom up. But, Twist everything around. And, uh, you know, the, the other thing, too, is it doesn't, it does, the, the order doesn't stop just at being put in place, but also, you know, commandments exist for protection of God's gifts for us. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned attacking the family. Um, Luther wrote about the three orders, um, yes. and you know, in in all of this as well, because uh, because it, it's not just this, and I know we have to focus the topic on kind of a, a you know relating to the book that we're that we're working through, but um, you know, in in addition to simply um, you know making the male and female, he instituted the family. Um, Adam he instituted as the priest for Eve. You know, he spoke, and Adam would speak to Eve. And then, and those things actually predate the fall, and then, and then government comes after, you know. So, so family, the church, and government also are instituted as part of that order as well. And uh, you know, God gives us guidelines to protect this, and because of the good that comes from it, and the bad that can happen when it's not, when it, when it's not uh, honored. Right. Right. Absolutely. So there is God's created order for men and women. This is also what we mean when we're talking about headship. We're not talking about a boss, a military commander of the home, or any such thing. We're talking about God's created order for men and women means that he is to work and to steward, here's his help, because he can't be complete without her, he just can't. Okay. But he is to protect and provide uh, and, and, pro and procreate, and, and she helps him carry out. And to the degree that the man is not the head of his home, that is not the head of the church, is not the head of society, to the degree he's not his given vocation, that's the degree of brokenness you'll find in that family or that church or that community, you know. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's just as broken as, 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 as we are. Let's um, move into the fall and what happened and how this got attacked and now look at it from this perspective that there is an order, you know, um, and, and pick up what the devil did to work against that order and is still doing. Uh, Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He, the serpent, said to the woman, We know from Revelation this is the devil. So, you know, did he possess this creature, take the form of this creature, whatever it is, whatever it is he did. Did God actually say, did God actually say, he's a one, one trick pony, he's still doing the same thing, but did God really say, create an imaginary gray area, you know, 
Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? See, he changes the statement to start her with saying, well, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Let's pause there. In Genesis 2, who did God tell, don't eat from that tree? Adam. Adam. So Adam is the theological head of the family. He has spiritual headship over his family. He is responsible for communicating to his wife. He's the first pastor. He's responsible for communicating the word, don't eat, to his wife, to the female. Now, did he tell her more and add to it, or is she adding more? I don't know, because God didn't say you can't touch it. He said don't eat. She's saying don't touch. Where'd it come from? I don't know. Doesn't say. But she adds more. Don't even touch it, lest you die. Okay. Verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Uh-oh. Countermanding God's direct word, going against the created order, notice that the serpent doesn't start with Adam, right. but with Eve. Because he's trying to break this relationship first, so that he breaks this relationship next. He's upending the created order. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now here the devil is calling God a liar. Did you catch that? <laughs> For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. You'll be a God. God's tricking you. He's holding you back from your full potential. Eat the fruit and have your best life now. Okay. Knowing good and evil. And remember in Hebrew, knowing, he, ancient Hebrew knowing is not just an academic knowing, it's an actual experiencing. Okay. Okay, so Adam will know his wife and they will have a child. He's just not like, oh, you're Eve. Right? <coughs> Knowing, so experiencing good and evil. Okay. So when the woman saw, verse 6, that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and here it is, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, ergo a god, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, not just the man, husband, who was with her and he ate. Wait, what? Where's Adam? In reaching distance. Wait a minute. God said to Adam, don't eat the fruit of that tree. Okay, then he made Eve. You tell Eve. You protect her. He's right there with the devil speaking, tempting his wife in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Adam says nothing. So Adam's sin is not only desiring to be a god, but in failing his fundamental purpose of protecting his wife. Let's see what happens. Will she keel over? Hey, she didn't keel over. Okay, I'll have a bite. Maybe this is okay after all. So, again, the created order because she eats the fruit. That's not what breaks all creation. 
The command was given to him. He fails to protect her. He waits to see if she dies. She's a guinea pig. And in failing to protect her, and then she doesn't die, he decides, I'll go ahead and break from God then. It's going to be okay. Now there's your original sin. Not Eve, Adam. I mean, you, you could hypothetically, I don't know if this is, if this is a good observation or not, but hypothetically, if, if sin had stopped from Eve, and let's say Adam hadn't abrogated, I mean, Im imagine a God who does not protect or provide. I mean, that's definitely ungodly behavior. Right. Theoretically, hypothetically, if, if sin had stopped there, if, if Eve had done this and Adam had not, Presumably the relationship with, between God and humanity at large still would have been preserved, but it was broken, right. it was severed between the, the species yeah. and the divine at that point. Yeah. Um, the, hypothetically, theoretically, God makes a new woman from Adam. Yeah. If it's just Eve. She dies, that frees him. Also from the bond, she dies, and he makes a new woman. But... But Adam cashes in the whole thing. Now it's ep it's gone, epic, we're done. And from that moment on. And watch what happens with the curses. Okay. Well, first, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, verse 8, the man and his wife. Uh, oh, back up, back up, back up, back up, verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, not literally, okay, the understanding. And they knew, they experienced that they were naked. They experienced, not that they didn't have clothes on, they knew that. They experienced vulnerability to the consequences of sin. So they hid. Right? Verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They experience the vulnerability that comes with guilt. Okay, the iniquity, they did it. The guilt is the feeling that comes with the iniquity. I actually deserve a consequence. I better go high. Vulnerability, they go high. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He's God, he knows. <laughs> let him, let him, <laughs> Grind it in a little bit, right? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, or rather, because I was vulnerable to your wrath for the first time. I was afraid because I was vulnerable, and I hid myself, and that's why God says, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were vulnerable? How'd you get that idea? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now the man <laughs> throws the woman under the bus. Right? Well, she's already been his guinea pig. Why not throw her under the bus? The woman, oh, the woman whom you gave to be with me, God, it's your fault. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, um, 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 the serpent deceived me. Here goes the buck, and there isn't even a buck yet. Ding, 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 ding. The serpent is eaten, passed the buck, and I ate. So, the Lord God follows the order of creation. You're the head of the family and the steward of creation. He starts with creation. To the serpent, he says... Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring, singular, and her offspring, sorry, your offspring and her offspring, singular. He, her offspring, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the Proto-Evangelium, or first gospel in the Bible. Genesis 3.15, first, first gospel. Offspring of woman shall overcome the devil. You shall bruise his heel, cross. Okay. 
to the woman, he said. Now he stepped, so he's so in the same order that the devil wants to wreck creation, God steps the punishments. Creation, now to the woman. I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. It's a good translation. Okay. Okay, because the old one said your desire shall be for your husband. Well, that, well yeah. But that's not what that meant. It wasn't a marital desire. Your desire shall be for his headship. So a consequence of the strife now that comes with original sin is that the woman will constantly test the husband, test his headship. And not just in the home, in the church, in society. Okay? There's going to be strife and struggle. So the vertical relationship between God and man is wrecked, and the horizontal relationship between man and man is wrecked, beginning with marriage. This is the damage done. Okay? Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So not only does she desire his rightful headship under God, he is going to lord it over her. It goes both ways. She's going to nag him to death, and he's going to be a jerk. <laughs> kind of like that. Okay? Right. And to Adam he said, so now we've gone up to this, we're reversing the order of creation, here comes the curse for him. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, there's you, one forward question. You not must absolutely never ask. <laughs> That's okay. Because you've listened to your wife means you weren't the head. You didn't lead. You didn't protect. Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Okay, so all creation now gets cursed. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And this thorn idea becomes huge throughout Scripture, associated with sin. Okay. The word for Mount Sinai, sine, sine is a thorn bush, the acacia bush. The wood of the Ark of the Covenant is acacia wood, thorny wood. The law gets put in the box, the thorny wood. The law, <coughs> sin, thorns. The cover, God's mercy seat, covers the thorny wood, the law, the sin, the curse. Jesus wears a crown of thorns, takes into his flesh literally our sin. Thorn, 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 thorn. It, when, is it also the curse of, of the earth that the thorn that's represents part of it. on the head? Uh, no, primarily it represents us. He's taking into his flesh. That's a great question, though. Our sin... So that when God shows up to give the law about the thorny curse of sin, he shows up in a burning bush, a sine, a thorn bush. It's the first time, and it said it's the Malach Yahweh, angel of the Lord. It's the first time Christ wore thorns for us. Pre-incarnate Christ appears in a burning judgment bush, thorns, sin. Yeah. All right? Um, by the so, so thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field, not the garden. Did you catch that? The Garden of Eden was easy street, but you're going to be booted out of the garden. You're going to go eat the plants of the field. Okay? That you have to produce yourself. But, right. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Here's the ultimate. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. That's a really interesting inversion of stewardship also. Um, you, you know, before, I mean, like you said, easy street, but it's, you know, man tending something that is fruitful and, and productive for humans. And then it, it's, it kind of becomes upside down where it's like you do it or else you don't, 
you know, now now you're scrambling to make food and to, yeah. you know, have have a place where before the place was for you. Um, and like you were talking about the thorns, that that's a real good, I mean, kind of a genius illustration on the part of God, right? Uh -huh. uh, because it's like, here's creation, even a, even a rose, you know, a beautiful plant or, or, a, or you know, so, something that uh, nettles or something that looks good, but yeah. but ow, that you know, it's it's there's a, an element of danger or broken brokenness. I, 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 I don't know that you'd call it brokenness, but it's like here it's beautiful, but but what a sting. Yeah, right. And so Paul will write that he prayed to God a number of times for a thorn to be removed from his side, but God said, "No, my grace is sufficient for you." My strength is made great in weakness. So the curse comes up. Same order of destruction. Bang, 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 bang. And by the way, this curse of all creation is why Paul writes that all creation waits, groans, as a woman in childbirth awaiting the redemption of all who are in Christ Jesus. Because Christ died to redeem not only people, but as you alluded, all of creation. And all of creation is waiting to be restored. And so we have um, hurricanes and wildfires and tornadoes and, and whack stuff because just in the same way that people don't work right because of sin, all creation doesn't work right because of sin. The whole thing's uh, broken. So global warming is sin. Huh? Well, sin. it's not that we can't contribute to things. I mean, yeah. the fact is, there are wildfires, but that doesn't mean that throwing, you know, letting the campfire smolder and walk away from it and woof, you know, see what I'm saying? Because we're broken, yeah, we contribute to a lot of these um, constantly, to a lot of these uh, terrible things. So verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve, and notice the husband and wife language, or male, female, that's it, that's what marriage is. Because she was the mother of all living. All living what? All living people to come. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. This is the first blood sacrifice for sin. To make, right, to make those skin garments, some animal had to die. The shedding of blood to cover sin. And it points forward to Christ, um, the offspring of the woman that one day will strike, will crush the serpent's head, while the serpent um, wounds, bruises his heel. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, any questions about this so far? Pastor, at, at, at creation, uh, uh -huh. it, it seems that the arrow of time was also created. Uh huh. Um, it doesn't say how long from the creation of the man and the woman did this determination or this temptation that's, occur. I mean, it could have been right. that's right. Could have been millennia. Could have been eons. I mean, we always imagine it as the next day, yeah. which is I don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah. Is there any reason to believe that it, it's one or the other? Or um, you know, it doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say. It just says the serpent was more crafty. You just sort of in the timeline get the impression that it happened um, pretty pretty quick. Um, but it's an interesting point that you bring up, especially with regard to time, because there are a lot of questions about what is a day in the creation account. The Hebrew yom is a day, a literal 24-hour day. Um, I, mean, I wasn't it's used making like once. Yeah, no, it just gives me an opportunity to okay. segue. Yeah, um, but. Um, <laughs> But right, but no, it, it doesn't say, it also doesn't say when was the, the fall of the angels, which had to have happened beforehand for the devil to do this. Right. Uh, it doesn't say mainly because uh, the Bible is concerned with the salvation of man. So how long till he sinned, it's, it's just kind of not included. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a really great point, yes. Well, he didn't protect, which means yeah. maybe there was a little bit of time for him to, for lack of a better way of putting it, <coughs> I'm lazy in what he was told to do. 
because he didn't. Yeah. You know. The 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 Bible doesn't say so. I go with can't say can't com can't comment yeah. on because I just it doesn't. Uh, the, there, doesn't. There's there's other scriptural though. I mean, think about uh, th there's another thing that that occurs to me that's kind of like this too analogous, which is the Hebrews wandering in the desert, or or, or you know going up when when. Um, uh, Moses goes to, to speak with God to, to get the Decalogue. Um, it it seems it seems, and it doesn't say oh a week later. You know, I mean, they're wandering in the desert for you know forty years or, or whatever. Yeah. But it seems like after every providence of God for those people, it's like same chapter, next chapter, and the people grumbled. I yeah. mean, I, I oh, think yeah. that the 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 thrust of this is Adam surely sinned. I mean, it it yeah. it absolutely happened yeah. in the face of God, yeah. like to his yeah. face. There, and there's, there's kind of what counts, why, why the Bible tells us kind of, yeah, in, in salvation history, right. Um, you know, and it's interesting also, there are lots of things are fascinating and interesting about that he creates Adam and Eve and says be fruitful and multiply. Well, he certainly didn't create them as babies. <laughs> Babies can't be fruitful and multiply, you know, and can't go work the ground and da da da, you know. So um, he created them with age, which and, and you know inclines us to believe that he could be, obviously created the earth with age and so forth, and takes us in, into other topics. But uh, just the whole thing to me is yeah, very fast. And what was the fruit? He doesn't say everybody wants to know. The assumption is that it's an apple, but he didn't say that. It doesn't. And just, also, they didn't, didn't have Cain and Abel until they right? were outside of the garden. That's right. Yeah, which is a, a very big deal. Yeah. Pastor, why does the, the ASB sometimes take quotes and separate them as a paragraph? Like, uh, and it's not just God's words, it's Adam's words as well. So I'd have to see it. It's the ESB. This is the ESB. <coughs> ESB. ESB. Okay. What, what are you seeing? Just like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Yeah, so that's a great question. <coughs> so some of the things that are spoken here in Genesis are indented, and, um, and others aren't. The indentations, um, it, they're there because it's Hebrew poetry. Um, it's a different, it's, you've got narrative running, and then boom, poetry. And um, the use of those things uh, in, as poetry, sort of um, lends to the idea that they were maybe early liturgical <coughs> among the Hebrews. That that would, um, and there have been plenty who have said that, you know, Genesis two, rather than being a second creation account, is a more liturgical flow to it and stuff like that. It's all, all of that, I think, is fascinating discussion. Um, I, have, I, my, I have another question, but kind of a question first that branches off of this, which is that we understand that Moses uh, is the writer of uh -huh. the first five uh -huh. books. The Pentateuch, the Torah. Um, <clears throat> so, so I always sort of assumed there was some kind of Hebrew-y, you know, yeah. I mean, like you said, some sort of written-ness yes. to, to those particular sections. Uh, yeah. where, where do we understand that Moses is the writer of, of these books? Um, so, um, we understand, <coughs> sorry, from Scripture, uh, there are indications in Scripture about him setting these things down. Um, we understand uh, it's not as authoritative as Scripture itself, but historically handed down in other writings and things um, like that. But yeah, the scripture points to Moses um, as author. Yeah. yeah. My, uh, my actual question, if I can still ask it, is sure. uh, when we were talking about sin, uh, you know, and, and the, the only payment that's acceptable for sin in, in basically in, in God's <coughs> estimation of it is death. You know, you pay with your life for separation from the Almighty. Um, and I wonder whether there is a distinction or, or whether it's even worthwhile to have a distinction of um, the, the wages of sin, because they're sometimes described as God's wrath, right? Like God in, in anger, I guess, uh, you know, demands blood or... or uh -huh. how, how much do we understand 
the consequences of sin as being essentially the natural progression of, say, separation from holiness versus an actual active demand for payment. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so we don't have any way to determine that. Um, what we do know from Scripture is that there are both temporal and eternal consequences for sin and that God chastises for the purpose of um, bringing people to faith or back to faith and in some cases God chastises or allows the natural consequences to play out as a part of, well, that's what you get for sinning. One of the most famous of those is in Romans 1, and speaking of idolatry, and that those who were idolatrous also gave themselves over to unnatural passions for same gender, and that God giving them over to those activities is part of the punishment for idolatry. Yeah, so both of those things happen. How one determines that in one's own life is impossible for us. Yeah, veiled as we are with our understanding. I mean, I guess we sort of think of the natural ultimate progression of separation from God. I mean, we talk about, you know, love is a characteristic. Love is the, you know, characteristic of, of God. And being separated from God is being separated from essentially all blessing, all, all goodness. You know, God still in life gives us those blessings, but ultimately once you're separate from from God, you basically find yourself in a state of everything that is not godly, meaning you know, death, ultimately, if you're, if you're separated from connection yeah. to the God of life, what else can you have? By definition. Um, and so I guess in some ways, may, maybe we just understand it as, as wrath, I mean, the opposite of, of love, I suppose. I was just thinking about that, you know, it, because it seems like there's a very, it seems like there's a very if this, then that functional process of, of sinning. You know, if you do something bad, bad stuff happens as a, as a consequence of it. Yep. And, and I was just wondering, you know, if there's a distinction between that sort of natural, well, look what happens, this is what you get if you, you know, if you separate yourself from the God of life, but whether there's a more active component to it, I guess, is sort of what... There is. Uh -huh. yeah. It's both so. and. Yeah, we've got three verses left. Yes? Well, I would just say, I mean, God's the prime mover of everything. I mean, yeah. you, you, we don't, we can't possibly sit in judgment of right. what God does. Yeah. Um, yeah. His wrath is yeah. what it is. I mean, that's it is what it is, right? He's, yeah, he's, he's holy and unapproachable, yeah. and yeah, um, we we want to make him a kind grand grandfather, but he's not. He's, <laughs> he's definitely not. Yeah, um, my one of my um, systematics professors famously said, and then this was picked up by a lot of the rest of the staff at the seminary, and you'll still still hear it today. God's not nice. We want him to be nice. He's not nice. Nice is doormat. God's not a doormat. You know, he's the one who told the Hebrews, go kill all the inhabitants, men, women, and children. Go. And um, that was their punishment for rejecting him. It wasn't just arbitrary genocide. It was divine wrath and punishment, you know, for sin. So God carries that out, carries out his wrath against sin in multiple ways. Um, some include uh, direct intervention, some include indirect intervention, some include allowing natural consequences to play out. Uh, there are many, 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 many ways for that wrath against sin to be carried out. And, and it's serious stuff, too. Like, when you, when you look at, you know, the, the Egyptians, you know, taking the... Fr you, you could look... So, somebody could read, you know, that, that section of, of the account of the Hebrews and say, wow, that was really mean to kill the firstborn children. Like, oh, children, children. Do, do, do children deserve to die? Well, if, if you are... You know, it, it sort of doesn't matter your circumstance. Sin is a great equalizer. Death is a great equalizer. Um, you know, kill, kill the men, kill the women, kill the children, kill the livestock, uh, all of that. There is, there's no, it's not that sin is like a cute thing, that it's like, oh, it's not so bad, right. we can do it, and it's just That's fine. It. Uh, it, scripture is very clear and very stark in ways that are sometimes shocking to us about the severity of, of both our sin and the consequence of sin. And, and I think that's something that's important to keep in mind is that, yeah. uh, is that it's, not, yeah. it's not nothing, it's something. Yeah, that's it. The wages of sin is death, and we like to sideline that so that God can be the bad guy forever causing it. 
No, that's, you, that was the consequence announced from the beginning. We chose that consequence, and now we're going to say you're mean for doing what you said you'd do? Wait, what? <laughs> you know, um, we, we like to lower the bar. And I, and I know you've got a couple of verses, but I was just going to yeah. say, and I think that's like the genius of salvation, of because God doesn't just say, no, it's fine. You know, here's Jesus, and so everything is fine. Jesus takes that hit, that's you know, it. like the the big hit, that's it. not just for one person, for all people. For world, yeah. And and I mean, in retrospect, I, I think we kind of gloss over a little bit, but it's, I, I, I can only use the word genius because... God is satisfied yeah. for, for sin. It's not just waved away. Right. And, and that's why the importance of the Christian faith in Christ for having done that for us, right. it's, the only, it's the only way that it could have played out. Right, absolutely. Right, right. Okay, verse 22 and 23 and 24 are the end of chapter 3 in Genesis. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, and then it leaves it hanging. You know, you're supposed to fin kind of finish the thought. Um, had, and a lot of people want to know this, what would have happened had Adam done that? Um, Adam would have been confirmed in death for eternity. Death for eternity. Yeah. yeah. So this is God already protecting us from ourselves and rescuing us, at least initially, partially, from an eternity of death and separation from him by sending Adam out. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Verse 24, he drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way um, to guard the way to the tree of life so that man would not be confirmed in permanent eternal separation from God. So this is actually an act of mercy. We tend to view it as a, a terrible eviction from this wonderful place, but it's it's protecting. That's it's, th that's funny too because we we would even say like, oh, he should have just eaten from the other tree, which was the whole problem to start, you know. Right. And so we would tend to be like, oh, well, you know, he could he could live forever. Let's fix our own problem. Yeah, it never <laughs> works. All right, very good. We're a little over time, so let's. Um, thank you. Great job, and uh, we'll come back next week. And we'll, we'll see how this functional order of men and women is carried out um, in major ways throughout Scripture by looking at um, concentrated passages, um, also in the New Testament. So, very good stuff. Let's close with the words our Savior taught us. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you.